15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you for joining us. This is the Space Nuts podcast, episode 219. My name is Andrew Dunkley. I'm your host, and with me as always, the professional professor of all things professorable, <laughs> Fred Watson. <laughs> Hello, Fred. No, I don't profess to be any of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thanks, Andrew. Thank I couldn't think of a word, so no, I just made one up. All right. Yeah, well, that's a good thing to yeah. do. I make them up all the time. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it goes with the territory where I work. <laughs> how you been? Yeah, well, thank you. How, how have you been? All good here. Oh, terrific. Uh, I, I, Judy and I did a road trip last week. We went out um, out west of New South Wales, northwest. Uh, we went to a, an opal mining town called Lightning Ridge. I think a lot of Australians will have heard of it, but maybe people from overseas wouldn't have. But uh, it's it's uh, the only place in the world where you can get black opal. Mm. I saw a pendant, an opal pendant for sale in one of the local shops there for $121,500. I take it you bought it for Judy. I no, I just stole it and ran away. <laughs> but uh, it uh, it was remarkable, beautiful gem, yeah. beautiful gem. Uh, it's the second, the black opal. It turns out is the second most rare gem in the world. Well, there you go, behind the pink, behind the pink diamond. Yes, but yeah. on a on a weight for weight basis, it is one of the most valuable gems on the planet as well. Uh, quirky place, strange little place. There's mines all over the place. They're actually in the town. Um, just to give you an example, you, you, you um, can get allocated a 50 by 50 metre section of land and that's your mining entitlement. And what they generally do is they drill a hole down about 50, 60 feet till they get through the sandstone and then they fossick around under there in the clay for the, um, for the opal seam. We went down two mines while we were there. It's just an amazing place. Um, and then we went to the iconic western town of Burke on the Darling River and then came home through the um, the mining town of Cobar. They don't mine opal, they mine copper, zinc and gold. And, uh, again, the centre of the town has just got a massive open-cut mine in it. It's uh, it's a really interesting place to visit. Three very different but iconic uh, places in western New South Wales. So, and because we couldn't go to Canada, we called it the Not Canada, two, uh, Not Canada Tour Part 2, <laughs> and uh, we went out west. Yeah. Which the locals very much appreciated too, I might add, Fred. Your, um, yes, they would, of course. Uh, but you sent me a picture of the Astronomer's Memorial. What's all that about? That was really interesting. That was in Lightning Ridge, which gives you an idea of how quirky the place is. Somebody on, on their actual mining allotment, you've got to imagine um, that, that, that usually you just uh, build a shack on it to, to sort of sleep in while you're not working. But a lot of people who've um, gone out there have, have decided to go the whole hog and built houses on them. Yeah. Well, someone built this amazing structure and called it the Astronomer's Memorial. I didn't know it existed until I looked it up. And uh, I went and had a look at it, but um, there's a bit of a dark side to it too, Fred. Unfortunately, the people who uh, owned it has sold it to a neighbour, and I don't think the transaction went all that well. So she gets very upset when people go to look at it. Oh, okay. So um, while we were there taking a peek, she came out, and I thought she had a broomstick and she was going to smash me with it. So um, I, I didn't hang around too long but yeah there's a i don't know much about it uh, apparently all the uh, famous astronomers are, uh, are, are listed on a wall in there somewhere um, but i think you have to be dead to be on the wall oh, right. fred <laughs> that lets us off then <laughs> yeah so you're off the hook so but, far. Uh, yeah strange place and there's there's another mine uh, another mining allotment where the guy has spent 20 something years building a castle Yes. By hand, yes. one stone at a time. And it is a fully-fledged castle. It's got a courtyard, it's got a tower, it's got... Yeah, you you wouldn't believe that it would be in the middle of a place like this until you came across it. And it's called Amigo's Castle, and it is remarkable. And he doesn't live in it. He lives in a shack out the back. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you do? I do remember... Oh, it's like 
Yeah, it's Lightning Ridge. That's many, what they many do. years ago, that's right. Um, uh, I visited Lightning Ridge, and and indeed, I um, uh, have a friend who had uh, a mine there. So we went down the mine and had a look at that. But it was his friends who were the interesting people, because they were all exactly as you've described, real real characters, absolute characters, every single one of them. We had a great time. Yeah, very very eclectic, very. Um... Yeah, some of them right on the edge. <laughs> it's, a, oh, yeah. it's a strange and amazing place, but I do highly recommend it as a as somewhere to stop over for a day or two, just to have a look around. Uh, and they do, they've got these self-drive tours and every everybody sort of identifies themselves with car doors. Oh, yes. So they'll have the name of their property or their mine on a car door on a, on a tree. Yeah. And, and they have a car door, they have five car door tours. So you follow the coloured car doors to go to different <laughs> points of interest. It's brilliant. It's yeah. absolutely brilliant. The, the other, I love it. The other thing uh, to watch out, and I remember this very clearly, to watch out for, because all, all these um, miners, because they're jealously guarding their properties, that they've got dogs that are, that are ones that you don't mess with. Um, and I remember um, one, of, one of the, the, uh, the friends of the people I went there with, um, the dog was tearing at the tyres of this four-wheel drive, shaking the car. Uh, so we, we didn't get out. We waited for the friend to come out so we could actually get the dog under control. It was quite extraordinary. Frontier Town. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing town. Very much worth visiting. Anyway, I think that's enough of that. We've yeah, been talking. Yeah. Through, <laughs> right. That's the end of the show. Over. Over. <laughs> it's all over. Yeah. All over. Can't do any more. But uh, the topics of the day, Fred, uh, we're going to look at the rusty crust on the moon. That sounds fascinating. Uh, a story that will be disappointing to some, but it doesn't mean um, it's an absolute no, but uh, it, it appears there are no signs of alien technology from um, recent surveys. Uh, we'll uh, talk about, very briefly, China's X-37B spacecraft and questions from the audience uh, about um, Mu Scorpi and the expansion of the universe. So that's all coming up on uh, episode 219 of the Space Nuts podcast. Now, Fred, let's uh, talk about the rusty crust uh, of the moon. What's what's happening to the moon? Why is it rusting? I didn't think there was any water or oxygen up there to do it. Well, the moon's going rusty. Um, it's not all of the moon. It's certain parts of the moon. But um, what's happened is um, there has been a reanalysis of, uh, data from the Chandrayaan Moon Mineralogy Mapper, Mineralogy, I beg your pardon, not Mineralogy, Mineralogy Mapper uh, instrument, um, which is which flew, um, Chandrayaan was uh, several years ago, it's an Indian space research organisation uh, spacecraft orbiting the moon, uh, discovered water ice on the moon and it essentially mapped out the minerals. It had this mineralogy mapper on board. Uh, and so there has been um, basically a reanalysis of some of the, the data that have come back from that. And what has emerged from that is signs of hematite, which is an oxide of iron. If I remember right, is hematite fool's gold? No, it's not. That's something else. I can't remember. Anyway, um, the uh, um, uh, oxide of iron, which is effectively rust. <clears throat> but um, hematite is present on the moon, probably in small you know, in small quantities, but it's it was detected by the mineralogy mapper instrument. Um, and it's a puzzle to understand how it gets there because for hematite to form, you need oxygen. Uh, and the moon is not well placed for oxygen. Uh, it's got this, this hydrogen there, which is released by the, the water ice that's on the moon, but not oxygen. Um, and so the puzzle has been to try and understand uh, why that hematite is there. And I think it's pr pr predominantly at the poles, which of course is where the, the water ice is as well in these re really deep craters that never get the sunlight. Um, but the, uh, the research that's been done, uh, and this is quite a large group of, uh, of planetary scientists, uh, the, the, um, the, the work that they've done actually suggests that the oxygen comes from the Earth um, and basically is transported along the, uh, basically, the, the Earth's magnetic field. So uh, you've got to get this picture in your mind of what that magnetic field looks like. We're used to, you know, bar magnets having a magnetic field and that 
you can kind of probably imagine the field lines being the, the, those kind of circular things. I'm waving my hands around here, <laughs> Andrew. Not even you can see me, so let alone our listeners. I could hear it though. Oh, you could hear it. I could okay. hear it. Oh, that, 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 that figures. Anyway, you know what a magnetic field looks like, but the Earth's magnetic field is highly distorted by the sun's magnetic field and so the, the magnetic field sort of trails behind it and um, the, the analogy that's usually used is it's just like a windsock uh, you know how a windsock points in, uh, in the away from the direction that the wind's coming from likewise the solar wind um, the earth's magnetic field trails behind it and of course um, the moon passes through that uh, every month basically <laughs> passes through that that windsock as it goes around the earth and that is the suggestion as to how the oxygen has got there, uh, which has reacted with the iron to form this uh, hematite. Uh, really, quite quite an extraordinary, um, uh, you know, an extraordinary story. Uh, and it, it it might sound a little bit speculative, and maybe it is, but it is a model that works. The um, the you know the 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 calculations that have been done. Uh, on the on the the possibility of this happening all come out positively so it's uh yeah it's big news we can go iron mining on the moon maybe not because there's no oh, wonderful <laughs> yeah i just see people probably and, and i'd be guilty of this think that once you get to the limit of the atmosphere that's where the oxygen stops and, and as you do increase your altitude the oxygen levels decrease significantly and that's why they have to uh, have oxygen uh, supplies for those um, high altitude uh, aircraft and uh, and some of the daredevils who go up there to just jump off a platform for the fun of it. Uh, but uh, it seems that there is some form of oxygen going well beyond that. That's um, that's right. That seems to be the indication. It, it, extraordinary, yeah. And l let me just correct myself uh, for something I said earlier. Um, fool's gold is actually iron pyrites. Um, I'm getting my uh, iron iron compounds mixed up. Uh, or pyrite, sometimes called pyrite, because it looks like gold. Hematite, if I remember rightly, is black. So there you go. Or rusty, anyway. Mm. <laughs> I, I used to have a um, rock collection when I was a kid, put it together for my scout troop. So I had all of those yeah. in well, my rock collection. You should have been straight. I don't know whatever happened to it. <laughs> yeah, it's probably like a lot Vanished. of things you collect when you're a kid. It just somehow vanished one day. <laughs> it disappears, yeah. Yeah. I'm still looking for my first pair of Ugg boots. I don't know what happened to them. Oh, they probably walked on their own, didn't they? I, they probably were capable of it by the time I finished with them, yes, indeed. Hmm. All right, so the, the moon is basically rusting yep. and that sort of brings into play the future uh, potential for mining the moon. Uh, it must have some uh, interesting minerals on it that um, people would have their eyes on at some stage, I, I would imagine. Uh, that's right. That's the, the next step, of course, is um, to go and trash the moon. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, we've crashed a lot of stuff into it so and left all our junk up there, so yeah. might as well go and dig a hole or two. Yeah. It'll end up looking like Lightning Ridge, <laughs> basically. That's right. Mm. All right. Uh, you're listening to the Space Nuts podcast with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and with a go. Space Nuts. Now, a lot of people who listen to Space Nuts have their favourite podcast distributor, whether that's uh, Apple Podcasts or, uh, oh gosh, there's just squillions of them. Uh, a lot of people have uh, been logging onto YouTube to listen to us, which is great, and uh, that, that's fantastic. We need to uh, get to a target of 4,000 downloads per episode, I think it is, uh, and we're getting getting closer to it. I think we're over 3,000 per episode now that uh, listen via YouTube. So uh, thank you for doing that. And if you would like to, it's pretty easy to find us on YouTube, just uh, in the YouTube search engine. Space Nuts Podcast is all you need to put in there. And you can subs uh, subscribe. But whatever way you like to listen, we appreciate it and thank you and, uh, and keep on listening. And don't forget to tell your friends, share it via your favourite social media platform as well. Uh, and, um, yeah, if you know anybody who's keen on astronomy and learning as much as they can about what's going on out there, um, make sure you tell them about the Space Nuts podcast. We'd uh, certainly appreciate uh, that. 
Now, Fred, uh, this next story is going to come as something of a disappointment, I suppose, to a great many people, but um, there's been a, a, a cross-section survey of 10 million stars and there is not a drop of water on Arrakis, which is a metaphor for no signs of alien technology. Exactly. <laughs> At least not in the 17 hours of measurement that were made uh, by this experiment that was done by people I know, actually, over in Western Australia. So the story is, it comes from uh, a telescope called the Murchison Widefield Array, which is at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, in Western Australia, one of the most radio quiet regions in the world. Uh, and that's also going to be the site of the Square Kilometre Array low frequency antennas, which will be one half of the Square Kilometre Array, the other half being in, in South Africa. Uh, so the Murchison Widefield Array is run by um, uh, basically um, the, the, uh, a, a, a group called uh, ICRA, which is the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. Actually, it's run by Curtin University. Curtin University, but ICRA uh, and Curtin University work closely together. And two scientists, uh, I certainly know one of them, Steve Tingay, uh, and his colleague Shannon Tremblay, I think is how you say the name. Uh, so those uh, scientists have been using the Murchison Widefield Array to look at a supernova remnant, uh, which is very prominent in the southern sky. The Vela supernova remnant was beautifully imaged uh, in colour using the UK Schmidt telescope by David Malin back in the 1980s, a very well-known image uh, which um, uh, kind of, you know, set the, the, the pattern for colour imaging uh, with, with visible light telescopes. Um, and we now have much better images than those because technology's moved on, but uh, that's a region of tangled, a tangled mass of hydrogen uh, that is essentially the remnant of a supernova uh, that exploded if I remember rightly, it's of the, of the order of 10,000 years old, but that's pulling it from my memory. So these scientists have been looking at that region, uh, but they're looking in frequencies, right there. So they using the Murchison Widefield uh, Telescope. They're looking in frequencies that actually correspond to the FM frequency band that we use here on Earth. And their Ooh. instrument is extremely sensitive uh, the, the other thing I love about the Murchison Widefield Array is that it looks in many directions at once. <laughs> it doesn't just look at, you know, it looks essentially at a huge chunk of the sky uh, simultaneously. It's a wide field telescope in the traditional sense of the word. <clears throat> and the Schmidt that I used to work on, the Schmidt telescope, was also a wide field one, but that was in, in visible light uh, wavelengths. Anyway, um, what they've done, uh, the scientists uh, have essentially looked uh, for a long period uh, in the constellation of Vela, looking uh, for observations that will allow them to study the supernova remnant. But essentially, uh, they are also, because they're looking at in the FM frequency band, um, you know, almost inadvertently, but of course they, they know they're doing it, they're not doing it <laughs> unintentionally. They're also looking uh, for any possibility of intelligent signals or artificial signals. Um, so, as um, uh, Shenoa said, uh, the MWA, Murchison Widefield Array, is a unique telescope with an extraordinary wide field of view that allows us to observe millions of stars simultaneously. We observed the sky around the constellation of Vela for 17 hours, looking more than 100 times broader and deeper than ever before. With this data set, we found no techno signatures, no signs of intelligent life. Now that's, you know, that's, um, I, I guess it's uh, to, to some extent to be ex expected. But if um, you would think that in, in a, th those millions of stars that they've observed, if one of them had a planet on it or going around it with lots of FM signals escaping from it, and indeed they do from the Earth, uh, the FM band actually escapes from the Earth, then you would think that we might pick something up. So they estimate about 10 million stars at a variety of distances, have been surveyed by this technique uh, in their 17-hour snapshot. Um, there was another comment uh, which may have come from Steve Tingay. Yes, Steve Tingay says, um, 
a quote that I love a lot because I've used it myself. As Douglas Adams noted in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, space is big, really big. And even though this was a really big study, he says, the amount of space we looked at was the equivalent of trying to find something in the Earth's oceans, but only searching a volume of water equivalent to a large backyard swimming pool. So they wow yeah so, so uh, well, um, people people are disappointed with the news that they've found no signs of alien technology could breathe a sigh of relief we might have just been looking in the wrong place well that's right there's there's only a small um, you know just a small and with with a seventeen hour um, study it's you know they could have all had blackouts simultaneously at that time and not been able to transmit. And that you know who knows what kind of technologies uh, they're using. This this search specifically, I guess, looks for um, you know civilizations like our own at the at the particular point in our own evolution technologically yep. to where we've got to, uh, where we are leaking radio signals into space. Um, and the MWA is a great um, tool for, for finding that, if, if it exists. Of course, the same applies uh, to the SK itself, the Square Kilometre Array, because that is in many ways, uh, even though it will look a bit different, is a kind of giant version of the MWA. It works in a similar frequency range, the, what is effectively the, the VHF band, uh, FM frequencies. And so that uh, that instrument will have a much bigger range. And as I often trot out because I love this statistic, apparently it can detect an airport radar at 50 light years or it will be able to when it's built. Of course, it's not construction hasn't started yet. We hope construction of the SKA will start next year, the Square Kilometre Array, a kind of giant version of the MWA. Mm. Yeah, actually, looking at a photo of the MWA, it's it's amazing. It's uh, made up of four thousand and ninety six dipole antennas that sit on a grid, which <coughs> resembles a spider web. And these things actually look like spiders. They do, it's don't they? Just, yeah, it's a fascinating as antenna array. It just looks. If you're driving past and looking at it, you go, "What the yeah. is that?" <laughs> <laughs> That's It'd be right. hard to get your head around. It, in fact, it's um, the photograph you're probably looking at is uh, really quite dramatic because it's taken from a very low angle. Um, but mm. actually, these things are only about um, you know 18 inches or two feet high. Uh, to, is that right? Yeah, right. They're, they're quite compact, um, and uh, you know it, they remind me a bit of coat hangers as well. Um, but yeah. <laughs> they do, don't they? they are, yeah. So the the SKA uh, itself. Uh, will be similar, except the antennas look, they're bigger. They're, they're sort of more than the height of, certainly more than my height, uh, which is 1.93 um, metres or six foot four. Um, they are like Christmas trees. They're, they're, they're a kind of different design from the MWA antennas. They, they just look like a forest of Christmas trees. And for the SKA in Western Australia, there will be 130,000 of them, <laughs> not just four. Good grief. <clears throat> Gee, that's that's going to be a lot of tinsel every year. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. It's a worry. Mm. Uh, and and you, you said you're six foot four. And before before the total knee replacement, he was six foot two. So <laughs> who knows? Obviously, made a mistake there. Mm. Um, but he only had one knee la- done, so he's sort of standing lopsided. Yeah, probably. <laughs> mm. All right. Uh, well, there's still hope for life beyond Earth. Uh, of course, the other uh, thing to consider is, as you said, we're looking for people or or, or you know, life forms that have reached the same stage in evolution as we have, but uh, there could be cave persons. Oh yeah, or there could be, or there could be planets that have just got animal life. Yeah, uh, exactly. and and then you know they can't sort of tell us anything about anything. So or water um, there's all those possibilities. Yeah, water planets Sorry? with with water planets with only marine life. You know, that's uh, yeah, and all and all you can hear is. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? <clears throat> uh, although my, my theory is that um, the civilizations are looking at us and going, they're using FM. <laughs> well, that could be yeah. that could be true as well. That could be the case as well. Maybe. <laughs> You're listening to Space Nuts, um, and in some cases on the FM band. It's certainly the radio station I work for broadcasts on the FM band uh, with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. <laughs> Watch.
Space Nuts. And again, we say thank you to those supporters who choose to go the extra mile and pay us a million dollars a month to listen to the podcast. It's um, it's wonderfully gener- generous of you. It's actually closer to a um, dollar uh, fifty a month. No, it it doesn't matter because uh, if you have decided upon yourself uh, to to donate to the podcast, it is greatly appreciated and thank you. If you do want to become a patron, you can do that through the Patreon website, patreon.com slash space nuts, or if you prefer to use another platform, you can do that through Supercast or Acast. All the details are on our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Uh, but thanks again to our patrons. Of course, as a patron, you get an ad-free uh, early edition of the Space Nuts podcast, and we do uh, add uh, bonus material uh, for Patreon uh, or patrons uh, every uh, opportunity we get. So stand by for some of that in the, the not-too-distant future, although there's plenty there at the moment to w- work your way through. Now, Fred, um, we're going to talk about something that China's up to, but uh, I'm guessing that um, there's not much to tell because I assume this is all fairly top secret. Yes, that's right. Um, this was... Uh... It, it, you know, it harks back to a story that you and I have covered a couple of times, which is the uh, the U.S. military's X thirty seven B spacecraft, which is something that looks like a, a quarter scale version of the space shuttle. Uh, it's a space yes. plane essentially. It's launched vertically on a on a, a normal rocket launch vehicle, but lands like a glider, just as the space shuttle did. Uh, so we have had an announcement that the Chinese have got something similar. Uh, it was uh, l- launched, I think, uh, about a week ago. Uh, but on the 6th of September, uh, the Xinhua News Agency uh, announced that this they had successfully tested what they're calling a reusable spacecraft, uh, and it had returned to its, to its scheduled landing site after a two-day mission in orbit. It launched, actually, on Friday the 4th of September. There you go, there's the date, from the... Uh, Shukan, I can't pronouncing that incorrectly, but it's a satellite launch center in the Gobi Desert. Um, so really interesting, uh, a snippet of news from Xinhua that uh, perhaps the Chinese have got a very similar vehicle to the X-37B that um, may well uh, be doing the same sort of research that the X-37B is doing. Um, apparently, we do know uh, from independent observations that this vehicle uh, reached an altitude of 350 kilometers, but it also did something that I know the X-37B itself was built to, to try out. Uh, now, this is back in the late 1990s uh, when the X-37B was first initiated. Um, and that was to, to do orbit inclination changes. <clears throat> so we believe that the Chinese version, uh, uh, the report I've read, says it was initially launched at an orbital inclination of about 45 degrees, but then performed a dogleg manoeuvre to change its inclination to 50 degrees shortly after launching. That comes from the Forbes account of, of this uh, uh, of this uh, flight. So that's significant. You know, if you can change the angle of the orbit of a spacecraft, it, it means you're, you're, you're actually... Um, it means you're more versatile. It makes you more nimble in orbit. And, of course, I guess that would be something that um, is, is always of use to the military because these things, uh, certainly certainly the US one is a military space plane. We're not quite sure about the Chinese one because we know so little about it. Um, there, there was a hint in the South China Morning Post uh, from an unnamed source uh, suggesting that um, you know, to to to, um, to to get an idea of what the Chinese uh, version is like, you should look at the US X thirty seven B. So it is very similar. Yeah, yeah. interesting stuff. And of course, both air, uh, spacecraft are very mysterious because a lot of the time we don't know what the X thirty seven B is doing. Uh, a lot of speculation, but um, sometimes they just don't tell you what it's doing. But it spends in. Uh, an incredible amount of time in orbit. Yeah, uh, that stays right. up there for years. Yes, indeed, that's exactly right. Um, Rather extraordinary. 
Mm. Um, and I'm guessing the Chinese are looking at it and achieving the same kind of thing. Um, I, that's that's the surmise. That's right. Um, we we are really you know clutching at straws at the moment, but uh, it's uh, it's an interesting development, and uh, we look forward to hearing more about it. <laughs> yes, indeed, it's the new space race, and yeah. Uh, yeah, China's catching oh, up fast. It's just mm. one part of it. That's right. Yeah, China's doing yeah. very well, indeed. Indeed. All right. Let's move on to some questions, Fred. And our first question comes from Nathan in Melbourne, Australia. Hello, Fred and Andrew. Nathan here coming from Stage 4 Lockdown in Melbourne, sitting in front of the pizza oven on Father's Day, enjoying a quick gaze at the stars. Uh, Andrew, great job with... uh, all that you do and putting this together and Fred thanks for your time um, my question is the are you able to see a binary star M01 SC0 or well, the alternate name is SA02081 you can definitely see them close together I'm looking up but when I use the app, it only shows the one star. So I just want to see if that's possible. Also, just wanted to see if you guys ever just go out and look at the stars without using the telescope and enjoy that just as much. Great show and hope you have a great week. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Hopefully uh, things will be relaxed in the not-too-distant future for the people of Melbourne who've been going through a second wave of coronavirus and have been uh, suffering through those significant lockdowns. But uh, the numbers are starting to work back in favour of uh, of Melbourne, the the, the caseload starting to drop, which is good news. But, um, yeah, our thoughts are with you, Nathan, Uh, and thanks for your kind words. Okay, Uh, he mentioned um, a binary star system. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it, Fred. Yes. Uh, So what uh, Nathan's talking about is it's a pair of stars, which is a little bit more than a pair, as you'll here in a minute, but um, they they called mu Scorpii. So mu is uh, the something letter of the Greek alphabet. Um, it's what we call a bio letter, and it's uh, you know as you know we've got alpha, alpha centauri, and all the rest of it. That's how they named uh, the the order of bright stars uh, in a, in a constellation are uh, named in basically in order of brightness. And when you get to mu uh, in the constellation of Scorpius, you've got mu Scorpii. So Mu Scorpii is actually a pair of stars, and exactly as Nathan says, you can separate them with the naked eye. Um, the separation is actually a tenth of a degree. And so to, just for comparison, uh, the moon is half a degree in diameter. So the separation is a fifth of the, of the moon's diameter, which is pretty easy to, to, to see uh, with the naked eye. Um, just as an, uh, an aside here, uh, I, uh, because of that figure of a tenth of a degree, uh, on the 21st of December this year, we will have a conjunction of the two giant planets, Saturn and Jupiter, in the western sky, where their separation will be a tenth of a degree. It's a very, very close conjunction, apparently the closest mm. since 1623. Uh, they haven't been. They, they get close every twenty years or so, but they haven't been this close, um, you know, for uh, almost four hundred years. So worth a look on the twenty-first of December. That's just a plug for something that we will no doubt talk about later on in the year, assuming we're still going by December. Um, but Mu Scorpii. Okay, so the two stars uh, that you can see with the naked eye. Um, one of them, and this is the one with the SAO number that uh, that Nathan mentioned. Uh, an SAO, sorry, SAO number. SAO refers to the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. They produced a catalogue of stars many, many years ago, which I used to use in my research um, back in the nineteen seventies. Uh, and uh, so, this particular one is SAO two zero eight one zero two, and that is. Mu one Scorpii, so that's one just one of the components of this pair of stars. But Mu one itself, uh, the SAO star I've just mentioned, is actually a binary system, uh, and that is one that you cannot see. The, the stars are so close together; they're almost touching. Uh, they are in orbit around one another, 
Uh, and um, essentially, the only way you can detect that, that, that they're part of a binary system is by using professional equipment. You can't see them as a pair. You can see uh, the effect of the fact that they are moving around each other in the spectrum of the two stars. So uh, it's, um, and actually, it's also what we call an eclipsing binary, where one component, one of the pair of stars passes in front of the other, and so the, the brightness changes. Uh, so, yes, it's a, an interesting and complicated system. But um, I'm, I'm really glad Nathan mentioned it, because the last part of his question do, do we ever go outside and just stare at the stars? Well, I do, all the time. Uh, almost every clear night, I go and have a look to see what the sky's like and just remind myself of what's happening up there. Um, and, yeah, so tonight, it's probably not going to be clear here in Sydney tonight because it's raining at the moment, but I will go and have a look at Mu Scopi uh, and see uh, if I can pick out the stars in the tail um, and uh, and because it's the st essentially the, the start of the tail of the scorpion, that's that's where the star is. I'll have a look okay. at it, see what I can find. I too, Nathan, do um, pop outside and have a look around when it's not too cold, and and especially on beautiful nights like we've had lately, and and stare up at the at the heavens. I often don't know what I'm looking at because I'm. My, I mean, I know what's up there, and I know the names of things, but I've I've never been able to really track things down uh, as easily as someone like Fred could. But um, I use uh, those um, interactive star charts from time to time if there's something I want to identify. Uh, they're very handy. But uh, yes, I do like to look up there and see what's going on, I, and I always hope that uh, I see something unusual so that I can talk about it on Space Nuts. But um, not, not lately. Although with, uh, Mars has been making a prominent appearance in the eastern sky here lately, and uh, it's quite a sight to see, even with the naked eye, uh, late at night. Um, so uh, thank you, Nathan, for your question. Uh, Nathan also said that he was um, talking to us, uh, recorded his message on Father's Day, which may, may come as a bit of a confusing thing to say to non-Australians. But in Australia, we celebrate Father's Day on the first Sunday in September, uh, whereas uh, in other countries they celebrate it at different times. I think it's in August in the US. Um, but, yes, it was Father's Day last Sunday here, uh, which is always a frustration for my wife because Father's Day often falls on her birthday and she really doesn't like that. So <laughs> we've got to be careful. <laughs> got to keep it low key. <laughs> mm. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Let's go on to our next question. Hi, Andrew and Fred. I love the show. Uh, I have a question about the universe expansion. I think you have mentioned this several times. Uh, and if I understood it correctly, the universe is isotropic and expands equally in all directions. I can't get my head around this. Uh, expands equally in relation to what? Uh, I think you also said that there is no center of the universe. How can that be? If it expands equally in all directions, this kind of implies there is a center. Or, thanks and keep up the good work. I can't wait for the next episode of the podcast. Mm, thank you for your question, and I think you and I have had this discussion before, Fred, about if it's going out in all directions at the same time at the same speed, there has to be a middle. Well, yeah, <laughs> and that's what he's asking. Yeah. Um, and and uh, we don't know, we don't know his name, but we appreciate the question. Did you pick the accent? Uh, uh, well, I could. Yes, I wondered. Um, I would hazard a guess at Austria, but <laughs> who knows? Yeah. <laughs> Could be. It was. It's. It's a bit too soft to be German. Yeah. From what well, I can tell. But anyway, um, nice to hear from you. And uh, yes, it is a, a, a confusing issue: the expansion of the universe. So, Fred will solve it all for you right now. Thank you. Um, thank you. And good night. Look, uh, <laughs> it, so it, it comes down to um, what we can observe, because that's really the the significant thing. Um, and what we observe is galaxies moving away from us in all, di all directions. They move away at the same rate, um, proportional to their distance. So the, what we used to call the Hubble law, but is now called the Hubble Lemaitre law, because it, um, Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest who actually did a lot of this work in the 1920s, has always been neglected a bit. So we, we now include him in the, the Hubble law. What that says is that the speed a galaxy is moving away from us is proportional, directly proportional to its distance. 
The further away a galaxy is, the faster it is receding from us. And that is true over the whole sky. So the hubble lemaitre law works over the entire sky. Um, in other words, it is isotropic. That means that the recession velocity is changing at that rate uh, everywhere the same. I'm not perhaps expressing that very well. So what you might immediately in infer from that is that we are at the center of the universe because everything's racing away from us and the universe is clearly expanding but it's actually not the case it's that's just an artifact and the the example or sorry the analogy that, that has always been given uh, in astronomical textbooks is to imagine a fruit cake <laughs> which is expert which is basically expanding in the oven as you cook it and all the currents in it are moving away, are they just their separation is just increasing as the expansion goes ahead. And no matter whereabouts you were in the fruit cake, you'd see things, the currents expanding away from you. And that's the same with ourselves. No matter where you are in the universe, you are going to see this Hubble Lemaitre effect. You'll see the galaxies moving away at the uh, at a, a, a rate that is proportional to their distance. I've, I've got a bank account that does exactly that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everything moves away. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. This is, is this a veiled appeal for more Patreons, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Also got a share portfolio that's doing all that at the moment too. <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, that's a different story. Um, so, uh, you, yes, you, you would you could imagine that maybe we are the centre of the universe, but we're not. Um, we are just a random point in the universe. Now, the big question is, we really don't know how big the universe is, and we don't know whether it's got any boundaries. These are, um, you know, the things that people study, and uh, there are various theories that relate to these ideas, but we don't know for certain. The universe could be infinite. Uh, and, and if it is, there is no middle. Yes, that's right. Well, that's right. So there's no middle. And that also links with the idea which basically is is turning the Hubble law on its head. If everything's expanding away from everything else, then there must have been a point when everything was in the same place. There must have been a time, and that's when we, what we identify with the Big Bang, thirteen point eight billion years ago. Uh, so, if the current best bet theory, which is based on Einstein's theory of relativity, is true, then at, at this point in the distant past, 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was a singularity. It was a point with no dimensions. Uh, and um, now physics don't, doesn't let us handle that at the moment, but that's the inference from what we can measure. Um, and that means that everything in the universe was in the same place. Uh, mm. <laughs> then it expanded and, you know, and, and now the, everything that was next to each other at the start um, is now widely separated, but any point in the universe could be regarded as the middle because it was it came from something with no dimensions. That's the the tricky bit. Um, it's it, it is totally counterintuitive, Andrew. I, I absolutely understand why this does people's head in heads in. It does mine in too. But um, that it, basically, if you think about what observations we can make it sort of makes more sense that um, isotropy of the expansion comes directly from our observations. Uh, the universe is expanding at the same rate in all directions. Okay. Hope that helped with your, um, your confusion. Uh, it is a very, very uh, odd thing to try and get your head around, I must confess. But I uh, appreciate your question. Thank you for, uh, for doing it as an audio question. We certainly do encourage that, which you can do on the AMA tab on our website, spacenutspodcast.com. Click on the AMA tab. If you've got a device with a microphone, uh, it's as simple as saying, hi, I'm Fred from Sydney, and I have a question about Andrew's golf game. <laughs> How good is he really? Uh, it's got nothing to do with astronomy, uh, but it's got a lot to do with physics. Uh, but, um, yeah, that's as simple as it is. If you want to ask us a question, uh, we love audio questions, but we do get them on text as well, and we're more than happy to take them that way. You do not have to speak if you do not desire to do so. Uh, but we, do, we did actually get a really big batch of them the other day, Fred. Uh, which is great. So we're going to dedicate next week's show, episode 220, to answering as many questions as possible because we've got quite a backlog at the moment. Now, Fred, 
Yeah. I have another piece of audio that's not a question, but I did have a bit of a whinge about my sore back last week. So uh, somebody sent me some advice. Hello, Andrew. So sad to hear of your back trouble, but uh, a little bit of advice from someone who's been there. Get your GP to uh, give you a referral to a neurospine specialist. Ditch the chiropractor. Get some real help. I'm sure it's uh, the way to go. <laughs> now, I, I don't know where the nearest neurospine specialist to Dubbo would be, but I'm guessing it's at least a six-hour drive. <laughs> so um, you your back in. <laughs> your advice, which would do – well, my back was terrible after the driving last week, so, yeah. yes, you're right. Yeah. But um, thank you for the advice. I will I will look into uh, into other possibilities. Um, it, it, I, it, it's a lot better. It's still sore, but uh, I can get up and down without uh, any trouble and I can even put my socks on now. Um, it was that bad I couldn't bend over to put my socks on, which was um, – tragic but uh, it is getting slowly better but I'm now advised that I need to do uh, some core exercises to build up strength in my lower back and my glutes so that the back the spine is better supported to avoid the problem in the future so uh, it, it, apparently Fred uh, a, a, a side effect of our sedentary society is that our glutes become useless yes. and when that happens all the all the the work moves to another part of your body, and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, back pain. Simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> so do your back exercises, everybody. Yeah, I do. What right. I'm told. Part part of the physio um, for the for the knees, keeping the, those core muscles working properly. So I do my back yeah. exercises. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Uh, enough of our medical conditions, yeah, Fred. Yeah. I think <laughs> falling to bits here. What a pair of old. Here yeah, we are. <laughs> Oh dear, that's all right. That's why they made super glue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is actually thank what, you, Fred. Which is what st- stuck my knee together, by the way. I kind of guessed that. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, oh dear. Wonderful stuff. It's time we. Uh, it's time we got. It's time we got going. This is turning into yes, the, completely the wrong conversation. <laughs> Not a problem at all. But uh, I look forward to your company again next week, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. See you later. Please do. Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here on the Space Nuts podcast. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thank you again for listening. We'll catch you on the next edition. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. Um...